Hello! This lecture now is about of physiology of audition. And before we start consideration of auditory system functioning, I'm going to remind you some basics of acoustics, section of physics that studies sound, a sound with a natural stimulus for the auditory system. And first, definition, simple definition of the sound. Actually, sound is the mechanical wave. This is oscillation in a resilient medium, propagating as a wave with alternating areas of compression and rarefying of molecules, or simply of increased and decreased pressure areas. The molecules of the air themselves move just a little smallest distance in the direction of the wave propagation, but the wave of sound goes further and further with very high velocity. And velocity of sound in the air is considered to be about 343 meters per second. If we calculate it to usual kilometers per hour, it makes, it makes much more than 1,000 meters or kilometers. And sound propagation in the water is much faster because the water molecules are packed tighter and produce higher resistance and therefore velocity of sound wave becomes much higher. So, and in kilometers per hour it makes more than 5,000 even. Now you can observe the propagation of the sound wave. The source of sound is located to the left and then to the right side you can observe the ear itself and molecules of the air are shown with tighter packing in the area of compression where sound wave goes, the front of sound wave and then very fine um, area is between this and finally this wave reaches the ear pinna, goes through auditory, external auditory canal to, to the eardrum and produces its vibration each time when the front of wave comes with a and higher pressure, it moves the eardrum inside into the side of the middle ear and when rarefied area comes, it makes movement of the eardrum back to the outside. And so you can see sound, if it's expressed to the figure, it is figure of oscillation of the pressure around initially atmospheric air. And in time it looks like classical sinusoidal oscillations. This sound wave has characteristics such as amplitude and T. In time measured it makes a period of wave. But if it's measured not as a time but as a distance it makes the wave lens. Wave lens. And period and wave lens as you can see from the picture are proportional and <coughs> therefore both um, um, determine the level of the frequency of the sound. Frequency can be calculated as inversely proportional to the time period, but wavelength is corresponding to the time, therefore there is a connection between wavelength and frequency. But we'll come back to this again. Let's consider physical characteristics of sound and their perception. We perceive the intensity or amplitude of sound as its loudness. Perhaps you may remember from physics that loudness does not uh, directly proportionally depends on the intensity. This is the power function, loudness. And for example, to increase loudness two times, it's necessary to increase the intensity itself about ten times. So loudness goes not as quick as the intensity. But to compare, it's easy, you see the sound with high amplitude will be louder as the mm, sound with lower amplitude, which will be much less in intensity or soft sound. Another characteristic of sound is the frequency. And frequency we can perceive very proportionally to the reality. And we mm, perceive frequency of sound as a sound pitch. How much high is it? And here you see, for comparison, two sounds with different frequency. With less frequency it will be lower sound, and with higher frequency it will be higher sound correspondingly. Basic characteristic of the pure sound of one specific frequency 
are shown here, but also it's necessary to introduce one more characteristic of sound complexity, which gives the sound specific, the t specific uh, coloring or timbre. Because most of sound that surround us are not pure, like this first one. This is pure, simple sound with only one frequency. But to the right you may see much more complex sound, which results in summation of many individual frequencies, and therefore <coughs> it, mm, is a product of summation, a complex sound that consists of a uh, few at least frequencies. And most of sounds around are complex. So, perception of sound involves the following characteristics – loudness, the pitch and timbre. Due to different timbre, we can differentiate easily the sound of the musical instrument. They may play the same, the same notes, but each note is different for piano or violin or other musical instruments. And, uh, and this individual characteristic of sound is due to different set of additional frequencies that give different coloring to the timbre. Therefore, we can discriminate the voices even if they sing, sing the same melody without difference. So, but each voice has specific characteristics. And so this is because of additional frequencies. Now let's come back to the relation between, between wavelengths and frequency. Really, they are inversely proportional. Low frequency sounds are sounds with high, high wavelengths and high frequency sounds have short wavelengths. The limits of frequencies we can perceive are the following. From 16 Hz or 16 to 20, up to 16 to 20 thousand Hz. Of course, we may start for simplicity, for, for minimal limit, from 16 or from 20, but maybe it's easier to memorize when 16 to 20 for the beginning, minimal sound frequencies, and maximum 16 to 20 thousand. Why the upper limit is uh, of such great variety? Actually, 4 thousand difference is very big. It's not 4 thousand like for a lower limit. But it's related to the changes with age, natural changes. We don't consider pathological, but natural changes that occur during the aging. And adults Usual adults can hear only up to 16,000 Hz for average. And upper limit to uh, 20,000 20, Hz is for teenager. Actually, little children can hear even high frequencies, which are already in the area of the ultrasounds. But during life we lose this ability to hear high frequencies, and older people can hear much less than even 16,000. Usually it may be even half of this, about 8,000, but it's greatly variable and depends on person, and mostly depends on how much you know, the person uh, experienced very, very loud sounds during life. So the, the sounds with frequency less than 16 Hz are infrasounds. Actually, for us, they cannot be heard, but they are, can be perceived as a vibration simply, with very low frequency. And sound with frequencies above 20,000 are ultrasounds. Ultrasound we cannot uh, feel, as you may know from the ultrasound investigations that are produced without any sensation from the patient. Sensitivity to sounds is very, very different for different frequencies. And before we compare sensitivity to sounds, we need to know how to assess this sensitivity. And it is assessed by the value of the threshold of hearing. And what is threshold of hearing? This is a minimal intensity of sound of the certain frequency that causes the sensation of sound already that can be heard. And as usual for any threshold, the higher is threshold, the less is sensitivity, and vice versa. Less threshold corresponds to the higher level of sensitivity. Minimal thresholds, and therefore maximal sensitivity, is found in the following range of frequencies, between approximately 1,000 and up to approximately 4,000 hertz. These frequencies are in the middle area of the human speech. 
some of course uh, some voices can be lower than one solvent and some voices can be uh, of higher frequency than four solvent but main range of the frequencies of the human uh, speech belongs exactly to this area and during evolution it's not surprisingly that we develop a maximal sensitivity to this important way of information conveyed from to each other and for frequencies that are out of these limits very close to these limits it's still rather good for uh, sensitivity but for diff greatly different much lower and much higher frequencies the thresholds become greatly higher so it means sensitivity decreases dramatically and before consideration of sensitivity and range of uh, frequencies we can hear let's consider one more thing intensity of sounds the sound that we can perceive can be very much variable in intensity and <coughs> it's determined of course by amplitude of sound oscillations but it can be very different from minimal sound we can perceive up to maximal we can uh, stay with stand and difference is extremely great with many many zeros therefore we use not absolute values we use the sound pressure it's proportional to the intensity and we use the sound pressure in the logarithmic index this is called sound pressure level don't be scared these formulas are not much necessary for for memorizing but just necessary for understanding how we estimate the uh, intensity of sound in bell or mostly we use decibel the tens portions of one bell so it's and this formula px and p0 are uh, px given sound pressure of each individual sound and p0 minimal perceived sound pressure which is extremely low and if you compare this and take logarithmic index the whole entirely it makes the scale of setting of 14 bell or simply in decibel it makes up to 140 decibel so and don't remember don't forget the sound intensity we perceive as sound loudness and now we can observe the area of perception of the various frequency sounds first on the horizontal axis we have the frequencies from minimally heard 60 16 hertz and maximally the value is not shown but maximal to the right it will be exactly 20 southern hertz on the vertical axis we have the sound um, pressure level in decibel so we see a range from 0 up to 140 decibel and first thing we are going to do to place the thresholds and for each individual frequency point of threshold to make uh, taken together produce such a line and this is here in threshold therefore anything lower in sound pressure level cannot be perceived as sounding we cannot hear this because threshold is the minimal intensity of sound that is required to hear the sound so and you see the great difference this area has minimal thresholds which even less than 10 decibel it's a few decibel we can hear and as you can see this area belongs to the range of frequencies from approximately 1000 until approximately 4000 hertz oscillations per second so this is an area of the maximal sensitivity which corresponds to main range of speech frequencies but really speech may be lower and higher slightly and this is the range of speech you see it may start for the low voices even from about 125 hertz and uh, of course it can be uh, 250 or 500 but um, to the right it may reach even almost 8000 hertz but generally we use between few hundred until 4000 range and also in this figure shows the loud the sound pressure level approximately for the common speech not too loud not too soft from the distance one meter the range of uh, pressure levels we use is between 40 to 80 decibel as the example of much more variable um, intensity of sounds or sound pressure level here it's suggested the orchestra music you know the orchestra may play with a little number of instruments or it may 
all together tutti uh, start to play and in this case it may be rather loud so this much wider range of both sound pressure levels and if you observe the horizontal axis it's much wider range of frequencies and you can see here sounds which are rather um, soft not very uh, loud and uh, this is area of very loud sounds and above now you see this red line this is the pain threshold very loud sound may produce even pain sensation of course in before uh, with slightly less loudness these sounds already produce uh, uncomfortable sensation not, not pleasant but finally it brings uh, with further increase of intensity it brings pain which has the protective uh, significance because pain will simply make the person try to escape uh, listening to such sounds because they can be damaging for the auditory system and you can see that for very low frequencies the pain threshold may be about 100 decibel for most of other frequencies it's close to 120 decibel but 120 it's very intensive sound if as if you are standing nearby the uh, starting to take off uh, plane so it's an extremely loud sounds of course they can be damaging and now we finish the consideration of the introductory part about acoustics and now we can turn back to physiology of the auditory system first uh, just a sensory portion that comes from periphery to the center it's an auditor analyzer. Of course, each sensory system is first of all sensory, but also it has some efferent fibers. And as any analyzer, auditory one also consists of the peripheral part, conducting part, and the center or cortical part. As for peripheral part, it's very complex and can be divided into two parts, very important. First, sound conducting part or apparatus, which roughly includes outer and middle ear and sound perceiving apparatus which of course is located in the internal ear mm, I said that roughly that, the, uh, that not the whole internal ear really performs perception of the sound the internal ear contains the fluids, contains membranes and these fluids and membranes are also part of the sound conduction so just in general you may say that outer and middle ear are conducting part and internal ear is the perceiving but to be exact the perceiving apparatus involves only hair cells of organ coating let's before the consideration let's consider the general scheme of the auditory system parts of course you studied this in anatomy and i believe you have an idea about structure but let's recall the whole conduction pathway and let's begin from hair cells they are the structures which are involved into um, conduction to hair cells we'll consider later from cochlear cells the fibers come to the spiral ganglion and from spinal ganglion further information is conducted into medulla few areas first there's a cochlear nuclei then from cochlear nuclei information is uh, conducted further to superior olivary complex superior olives and then from medulla next level where new neurons uh, come we have the centers in the midbrain where the center is inferior colliculi of quadrigeminal plate from midbrain further conduction goes to the thalamus and in particular to the medi medial geniculate bodies and finally from these neurons of geniculate bodies information is sent up to the cortex which is located at the auditory cortex in the superior temporal gyrus according to Broadman numbers of the cortical areas have numbers 41 and 42 with 41 the primary auditory cortex and 42 for the second is the secondary auditory cortex which is involved into more complex analysis of sounds now let's add the efferent number of fibers much less of course but they are present which are um, intended to regulate sensitivity of the cochlear hair cells and internal ear not only we have also the middle ear 
and the outer ear. And all these three ears, I would say, they are combined into the peripheral part of the auditory system. Peripheral. From the spiral ganglion fibers until the fibers that come to the, go to the cortex, all this is the conducting part. And finally, the central part is the only one auditory cortex. So we finished consideration of the general structure of the whole pathway and now come back to the peripheral, peripheral portion of the analyzer or the whole sensory system. And we are going to concentrate on this exactly. Structures of the ear which we consider, which we are going to consider in order. Outer ear, middle and inner ear. Outer ear consists of the ear pinna and the external auditory canal. Then we have the middle ear, which is bordered uh, from the uh, limited from the out, outer ear by the eardrum first structure. Eardrum is connected with the malleus, the first little ossicle. The second one is the incus, and last is the stapes, which is inserted into the specific opening in the <coughs> bone. But first we need to indicate that there is connection of the middle ear with the external ear through nasopharynx, which is eustachian tube. Of course it's not as wide as here, but it's present. And now the inner portion starts from vestibulum. And the, there are two windows in the vestibulum. The windows into which the, uh, the stapes is inserted, this is the oval window. But there is one more round window which is covered by the elastic membrane. Then, here in the, in the inner ear we have also semicircular canals which belong to the vestibular analyzer, not included into the auditory system. And exactly belonging to the auditory system is the cochlea. Finally, impulses are sent to the auditory nerves from the cochlear receptors. All these structures we need to consider in detail. External ear. And first part of the external ear is the ear pinna. It looks like it's just decorative portion, but really it has also certain functions. Function number one is collection of the sound waves and direction these waves into the external auditory canal. The very complex shape of the ear pinna somehow contributes to great quality of the sound and direction of the sound into the external auditory canal. And also there is one more function that we are going to consider in more details later. That it takes part in the determination of the source of sound to find the location where the sound source is located. So these are two functions of the ear pinna. Then we come to external auditory canal. This is Latin name, Iatus Acousticus Externus. Approximately, in average people, the length of this canal is about 2.5 centimeters. It's not uh, straight, it goes under angle, and part of this is the cartilage and part is bony. According to picture, you may say that about 50-50, but in reality, the bony portion makes only one third, and the um, bigger portion is the uh, is uh, free moving due to cartilage, uh, which is um, uh, movable, flexible. And in order to straighten the auditory canal to see easily eardrum, the doctor needs to pull the pinna, ear pinna, upward and um, behind, so in diagonal direction upward and backward at the same time. In this case, the um, external auditory canal becomes straightened and eardrum easily visible from outside, of course, in case of enough light, which is provided usually by sp special apparatus. And functions of the external auditory canal. First, fun of course, it's clear, the simplest direct function, conduction of sound from the entry to the eardrum. But then, protective function. Protective function is performed by many ways. First, simply by presence of this canal, because 
in case it's absent, the eardrum is located just in the entry area, the eardrum can be easily damaged and uh, hardly possible to preserve it for a long time because the damage will inevitably come. And so it, and the, not only the eardrum, the, all the uh, fragile structures of the middle ear, not to say about the uh, inner ear, are hidden deeply in the skull. And uh, due to this, we have this uh, external canal that goes to the middle ear and then to inner ear. So this is uh, first protection, simplest, and bone uh, is protected well. Then uh, it has great amount of uh, nervous fibers and high sensitivity. So any little stimulation of the tactile receptors there will um, initiate the direction of avoidance. So the person will try to remove the ear and the whole head out of this action, uh, out of the stimulus that can be damaging. So it also contributes to the decreased uh, probability of damages. But also, uh, maybe it can be considered also a part of protection, but it's wider than simply protection, maintaining the constancy of conditions. And main conditions uh, are temperature and humidity near the eardrum. You see, the external auditory canal is open to the outside area. And outside area may have different temperature, different humidity, but exactly near the eardrum, we have much more constant both temperature and humidity. And this is important for the constancy of the properties of the eardrum itself. Because in case of decreased temperature, it can be much less flexible. And if it becomes less flexible, the sound conduction will be greatly decreased. So it's important. And really temperature greatly differs from the outer ear and for the area nearby the eardrum. And even there is a method of measuring the temperature near the eardrum. It's much less variable and it uh, corresponds to the brain temperature, actually. Then, one more function was found for this canal. It has its own resonance frequency. And it means that when sound with the same frequency passes through the external auditory canal, it becomes greatly enhanced, amplified. So, and this resonance amplification comes for the sound frequency about 3000 Hz. And again, you see, this is uh, from the range of frequencies used in human speech. So, in even the mechanical properties of the first uh, very simple external ear already, already provides much better hearing of frequencies of speech. Of course, not for the all of them, but close to the 3000 Hz. Now we move to the middle ear, and middle ear, first uh, border, is the eardrum. Eardrum is very, very thin, about 0.1 millimeter. It's flexible, but low extensible. It means that it just moves to one side or to the other side, but does not become stretched. It's like a membrane. It has an oval shape, and the approximate average uh, size uh, are the following. 9 millimeters per 10 millimeters. And <coughs> it's connected to the malleus. And handle of the malleus is exactly <coughs> connected to the eardrum, but then malleus is connected to next ossicle, which is incus. And incus in turn is connected to stapes, which is inserted into the oval window. And insertion goes with the flexible annular ligament, so that the <coughs> stapes is not fixed in position, because the oval window size is larger than um, stapes size, and so it's connected by flexible ligament, which allows um, insertion of the stapes into the inner ear and movement back into the side of the middle ear, which occurs each time when eardrum is involved into vibration. And the most important function of the whole middle ear is not simply conduction, conduction of course, but the amplification of the sound oscillations. It's very important that sound becomes mm, greatly amplified in its force, sound vibrations. We are going to consider now how it goes, this amplification. First mechanism of amplification can be observed uh, if you compare the size of objects that are involved into vibration. First, 
the eardrum. Of course, the eardrum itself is a little structure, but if you compare to oval window or to stapes basement, there is a great difference in size. And <coughs> the size of the uh, stapes is approximately 15 to 20 times less than area, surface area, so that if the same even pressure is conducted to a much smaller area, as a result, the pressure per square uh, unit of uh, area becomes increased proportionally to the same amount. So at least 15 to 20 times increase occurs due to difference in surface areas of the structures. But also there is a connection of ossicles by the lever system. And this also additionally increases the force of vibration. Not much, about 1.3, 30%. But together it produces serious amplification. So why it's so necessary to make this amplification? From the ear, where vibration is easily produced, we need to switch to the fluid. The inner ear is filled with fluid. And to make this fluid um, to vibrate, to create the wave of pressure in the fluid, it's necessary to have much stronger force because fluid is packed very tightly. And molecules of fluid uh, are, have great resistance to, to conduction of the mechanical waves and including the sound wave. So let's observe how it goes. First, uh, why amplification is required, we already considered, because fluid resistance to the increase of pressure is much higher. But then, to make steps uh, to be inserted into the side of the oval window, we should provide the opportunity for fluid to move somewhere, because this is a closed space, and it's filled with fluid which is incompressible. So, to make it possible to move the steps into the oval window, we need to have opportunity to move some part of fluid somewhere. And we have, to, in order to produce this wave of oscillation that will pass through the cochlea, we need to have this another window, round window, which is covered by elastic, with elastic membrane. And it's essential condition to make oscillations of pressure possible and to make it possible for movement of the steps into and out of the Mm, plane of the oval window. Each time when uh, steps moves inside, it produces the increase of pressure immediately and this pressure presses the elastic membrane so it bulges outside. And this provides the constancy of the fluid volume and it makes possible to make mm, movements of steps and therefore it's possible to create the wave of pressure that starts to go through the spiral canals of the cochlea. So, presence of the round window is very important. So, let's sum it up. The amplification mechanisms in the middle ear. In the middle ear, first, ratio of areas. Surface areas of the eardrum and the base of stapes make a big difference. And therefore, application amplification goes the same amount of times, 15 to 20 times. Second reason, connection of ossicles by the lever principle. I hope you have an idea about the lever. We <coughs> decrease the distance of movement with the same time of uh, increase of the force. So decrease in amplitude, increase in force. And this increase in force occurs 1.3 times. So, of course, the eardrum amplitude of vibration is wider than the amplitude of movement of steps. But steps makes movement 1.3 times with higher force, which is very important because the water or fluid inside will have um, resistance much greater than air. And total amplification therefore reaches the level about from 20 to 25 times, which is very important and this is one of one of basis for high sensitivity to sounds. Then let's consider the attenuation of sounds. Attenuation is the decrease of sound intensity. When it occurs? It occurs when the eardrum tension increases. And we can, we can consider two types of uh, cases of eardrum tension increase. First, passive changes. 
passive changes may occur when there are pressure differences between the outer and middle ear. And these are quick variations of atmospheric pressure. When, uh, high, when we quickly produce ascent or descent. Of course, mostly this is in plane, uh, but also it can be in the lift. And second case of passive changes is when the middle ear is sealed due to inflammatory process. But we'll consider in more detail. Now let's add some more active changes. Active changes are produced by the contraction of the muscle that increases the eardrum tension. The muscle exactly is called muscle tensor tympani. When this muscle contracts, of course, tension increases and the amplitude of oscillation of the eardrum under sound greatly decreases. Reasons of pressure difference. First, passive changes we are going to consider. Why pressure differences may appear? Normally, there is no pressure difference. Here we have atmospheric pressure, and here pressure in the middle ear, which is, in normal situation, equal to the atmospheric. But in case of very quick changes outside, like mm, plane taking off, in this case, atmospheric pressure uh, starts to decrease as quick as we take uh, high, go higher and higher and atmospheric pressure outside becomes less and middle ear pressure still is the same as it was in, in, on the level of the ground. And so now there is a difference of pressure that makes, that makes the an eardrum to bulge outside. Opposite case when plane is landing, but it results in quick increase of pressure outside restoring back to normal pressure due to the whole atmospheric column above, but pressure in the middle ear still remains the same as it was during flight. And so now opposite difference appears, which makes the, um, the eardrum to be moved inside. But in both cases it doesn't, mean we, it doesn't matter which side it moves, its tension increases and its involvement into vibration corresponding decreases. So the less vibration corresponds to less loudness of sound we perceive. So everyone knows how it happens when the ears become like blocked with some something on the other sides. And normally we know how to do um, to come back to normal ability to hear because it, there is a possibility of pressure equalizing between the outer and middle ear. And for this purpose we have the eustachian tube. Again, it's not as large as it's shown here, and under normal conditions it's compressed, but it can be opened periodically. It opens in case of swallowing, in case of yawning, even in case of uh, chewing and sometimes talking. So all these uh, cases are uh, open, so rather often the eustachian tube becomes open and immediately through nasal cavity the atmospheric air comes and um, if there is any difference of pressure it becomes uh, removed. So that's why, for example, uh, during takeoff and landing, they can give the, the suites that require a regular swallowing. And it helps to keep pressure constantly uh, equal, um, equal to the outer pressure in the middle ear. Then, in case of inflammatory process in <coughs> the middle ear, edema of eustachian tube mucosa may reach such a level of, uh, of uh, swelling that uh, swallowing and yawning does not result in opening of this tube and therefore the tube, become, tube becomes feel, uh, sealed. And it's important that the mucosa in, in the middle ear is able to absorb air gradually. So gradually it produces rarefaction and decreased pressure finally one moment produces enough difference so that uh, the eardrum is uh, moved inside and tension increases and here inability decreases until the moment when this inflammatory edema will pass and finally the opening of the eustachian tube happens. So let's observe the second active case. For this we need to have muscles. Actually there is not one muscle but two that involved into changes of conduction of sound. So these are uh, structures we consider eardrum, the ossicles, the three of them, 
then oval window, round window, the cochlea itself, and now we come to muscles. This muscle tensor tympani that keeps, uh, um, decreases the vibration of the eardrum because one side is attached to the malleus uh, handle, which is uh, connected to eardrum, and another to the um, walls of the middle ear itself. And similarly, there is one more, even smaller muscle, muscle stapedius, which is connected to the stapes and to the walls of the, inner, uh, of the middle ear. And so when this muscle contracts, it pulls out the um, stapes basement and it decreases vibration of the stapes. So when two muscles are contracted, both eardrum vibrations are decreased and stapes vibrations are decreased and conduction of sound that comes from outside, conduction to the inner ear is greatly decreased. So what is the function of these muscles? Well, first, innervation. I hope you may idea, have an idea about this. Tensor tympani is innervated by the fifth nerve, third geminal, and stapedius by facial nerve. This muscle have many functions, but generally, or in all the cases, when they contract, they decrease oscillations of both eardrum and the stapes. Mostly well studied is the so-called acoustic reflex. This reflex is the contraction of the muscles under direction of loud sounds. It's a protective reflex, and if sound appears, especially suddenly, uh, sound mm, louder than 90 decibel or so, these muscles, driven by reflex, become contracted. Of course, this reflex has a latent period, which approximately from 40 to, f to 80 milliseconds. So, at least it can be so as long as 80 milliseconds from the beginning of action of sound till the, uh, its uh, contraction of the muscles. And uh, in case of very, very loud, extremely loud sounds, they may not. Uh, this reflex may not have time to become initiated so that mm, prevention of damage may be not achieved and damage may happen like uh, tear apart the eardrum or uh, damage of the some internal structures but uh, if uh, it manages to contract muscles this reflex so protection is achieved and much less probability of damage uh, is achieved due to this contraction of muscles because it decreases greatly the sound conduction to the inner ear but it's not the only one function because they are contracted during day numerously and uh, additional to protective function provided by acoustic reflex and generally we have also <coughs> stimulation of these muscles um, simultaneously with the beginning of own speech pronunciation our own speech sounds are rather loud for us and so it's necessary to decrease the loudness of own, own speech sounds and a uh, certain contraction degree of these muscles provides decrease of loudness. But it's not everything. Also, contraction of this muscle um, inhibits especially, uh, especially effectively the low frequency sounds, the sounds with frequency less than 1,000 Hz. And this contraction provides separation of higher frequencies, mostly belonging to speech, at the general background, which can be noisy. So if you're trying to listen to someone, in the case of there are many uh, m m people talking around, and noise around, mostly you can hear from uh, sites the low frequency sounds of speech, they come easily. And exactly these sounds are easily suppressed by contraction of these muscles. So it helps to separate one exactly uh, voice nearby uh, producing sounds and to hear much better regardless of the general noise. So you see how many functions are performed by these muscles and they contact during day many times. So now we come finally to the inner ear. Let's observe the cochlea section. Look, there is a base of cochlea and the generally cochlea, as you may remember from anatomy, makes two and a half rounds. And this is an apex, and <coughs> the spiral canal of the cochlea is separated by two membranes into three portions, three separate canals. And two membranes that produce this separation are very thick 
basilar membrane and very thin vestibular membrane, also sometimes called raised nerve membrane. And due to presence of these membranes that begin from the main stem of the cochlea, <coughs> modialis, it's called modialis, and it comes to the peripheral lateral wall of the cochlea, both membranes. And therefore, there are three um, spaces, three canals are formed. They are called scala, or um, it can be translated as staircase. And scala tympani is a lower one, which is beneath the basal membrane. Then above the vestibular membrane, we have vestibular uh, staircase or scala vestibuli. And between them is simply scala media, middle <coughs> staircase. And exactly this scala differs from the others but because it's filled with different fluid, with endolymph in contrast to perilymph that fills uh, the upper and lower scala. And uh, the two, these upper and lower scalas, are connected by the opening in the um, apex, which is called helicotrema. And so they have one and the same fluid, perilymph, while the media, scala media, contains endolymph, which is very much different from usual extracellular fluid, while perilymph is close to extracellular fluid generally and especially to the cerebrospinal fluid. And exactly this um, scala media contains the receptors, the hair cells that form totally the organ of coating. Again, we can see the structure of the inner ear in more details. Here you can see one cross section where two um, the membranes can be seen, uh, vesicular and vestibular, three staircase or three skull, and now we can observe more exactly in more details exactly this portion which is in the <coughs> red um, frame. Let's enlarge this. And we observe this is organ of cordy. The cross section shows first it shows mm, many hair cells here located on the basilar membrane. Exactly on the surface of this membrane, we have two rows of hair cells, and above we have one more membrane which is uh, which has a loose end and just overhangs the cells. This is a tectorial membrane. The tectorial membrane is much less elastic and during vibrations of the basilar membrane it moves much less. And tectorial membrane is just above the cilia or hair of hair cells. Inner hair cells are located closer to the center of the cochlea, closer to modialis and just behind, just beneath the tectorial membrane central portion. And they have only one row. The number of these cells is less. It's about three and a half thousand cells and much more cells we have which are called outer hair cells and usually they are located in three or four rows in this picture you can see three rows therefore three cells all these cells have cilia on their surface and that's why they're called hair cells and the cilia are very important for the ability to react to the mechanical vibrations produced by sound Supporting cells are numerous here and specific lamina, the plate that uh, support the superficial uh, parts of cells. And also you can see here a number of fibers. Most of sensory fibers in re really come from the inner hair cells. But efferent regulatory from central nervous system fibers come mostly to the outer hair cells, which influence the sensitivity of the inner cells. But let's start in the order. First, this is another picture that suggests you the more uh, three-dimensional view, closer to three-dimensional. And also you can see the tectorial membrane is made uh, transparent here. So you observe the surface, the apical surface of the hair cells. And you can see that the cilia, hair or cilia, are <coughs> um, located in a specific order. So first, basilar membrane, and you can see here that inside the basilar membrane there are fibers. Fibers that come from the in medium portion and reach the end, but they are not uh, fixed in the end, just inside the basilar membrane they are located, but they do not reach the opposite lateral side. One of these fibers you can see here in blue. Then, tectorial membrane, which I already said is transparent, made transparent for a good observation of the apical surface of cells. 
then there is a tunnel of cortic between um, rods of cortic, then inner hair cells, one row, and three rows of the outer hair cells, and cilia on the surface. Efferent fibers, sensory fibers come predominantly from the um, inner hair cells, and the efferent fibers reach the outer hair cells. This is important picture for understanding of operation. And this is real picture now. This is electron scanning micrograph. And cross-section is done, but you should observe better the non, not damaged superficial level. Apical surfaces of the hair cells with the cilia. So, what you can see here are cilia of the outer hair cells, clearly. Because, you see, this is a... Mm, right side shows the center of the cochlea and left side shows the periphery of the cochlea. And even in the lower right angle you can observe uh, the cilia on the surface of the inner hair cells. But let's enlarge the outer hair cells, the apical surface. And on this apical surface you can observe the <coughs> cilia which uh, form something like V letter and um, they stand in uh, regular rows with the angle. And they are not of one and the same length, they are different in length. And longest, longest are located uh, more distant from the center of cochlea and shortest are closer to the center of cochlea. Also we can observe that uh, they come from the surface and they are straight and <coughs> Really, they can produce movement, but only uh, changing an angle of the attachment point. They cannot make hooks, and only they move uh, like uh, rods, the lower the one direction or the other. So they are cilia of the outer hair cells, and here you can observe the cilia in the inner hair cells. And they do not have such a shape like V-like. They are more like uh, air arc, like uh, arc. And this is frontal view, and here they are as an arc. And so perhaps these cilia, of course, are uh, shown from the apical surface of the inner hair cells. But now the picture is taken from the center of the cochlea, because first you observe the shortest cilia rows, and then they have become longer and longer progressively uh, to the, with more distance. But this picture is made mostly to show you with arrows the connection between the cilia. But they can be observed not only in the area uh, with arrows, they can be observed practically everywhere. Two little th threads go from the end of one cilia, shorter one, and goes under angle upward mm, to the mm, cilia of the next longer row. And all these connections are necessary for understanding of mechanism of excitation of the, cilia, of the um, hair cells of organ of coating. So, you observed, I hope you clearly see these connections. Now, let's observe what happens during sound vibrations. This picture shows the um, normal upright position of the cilia on the surface of hair cells. So, this is the position of basilar membrane at rest. But when sound comes, the um, ossicles uh, conduct the vibration from eardrum to the staves, and staves moves inside and outside of the inner ear. And each time it moves inside, it creates the uh, higher pressure, and then creates less pressure, and this wave of alternating pressures passes on spiral uh, way of the cochlea. And periodically basal membrane goes up, and then down, up and down. This wave goes along the cochlea and when the membrane, basal membrane, goes upward. The tectorial membrane does not move much upward, therefore two membranes become closer to each other and the inner angle is closed and all this yellow area is an endolymph fluid. And just imagine two surfaces become closer, and closer to each other and even without necessity to touch the cilia with the tectorial membrane. Anyway, the fluid mm, starts to flow out from this angle where the space becomes less and less in size. And regardless even of uh, touching the tectorial membrane, 
This fluid flow easily makes all the cilia move to the side on radius from the center, from modalis of the cochlea, to the st from stem to the periphery, or to the lateral wall of cochlea, like radius that comes from the center of cochlea to its peripheral lateral wall. And so all the cilia become uh, moved to the side of the longer. And in this case, you may see that ends of the cilia become more distant from each other. And this higher distance provides stretching of these threads that connect the cilia. And how, it, uh, how much is important, we observe from next slide. But now let's observe what happens when basal membrane in the next phase of wave goes downward. Downward it goes, and again, again tectoal membrane does not move much down, so the space between two membranes becomes larger, and it uh, attracts more fluid to enter this, and uh, endolymph enters this space, and all these uh, serial cilia start to move to the shorter, and their ends become closer and closer to each other, and therefore the stretching of the threads that connect ends of the cilia is much less now. And so it goes like this. Each time when vibration makes the basal membrane move up and then down, up and down, the cilia, like um, some underwater uh, seaweeds, move one side and then move the other side. And each time they move only in one dire you know, direction um, and then opposite. Direction from the center of cochlea as radius to the lateral walls of cochlea, and then they move back to the center of cochlea, and so it goes constantly with sound presence. And now, this is the position of the hair cell uh, cilia when there is no movement, no sound. Again, this is the position of uh, cilia when basal membrane moves up. In this case, all the cilia bend to the side of the longer ones. So this is stretching of the threads between uh, ends of cilia. And here there is no stretching because they all become um, bent to the side of the shorter ones. And so alternating movement produce stretching because of uh, enlarging distance, elongation of distance between cilia ends and then shortening of this distance. And now this is only schematical presentation of the hair cell with only three uh, cilia shown but at least they uh, represent the three rows of uh, cilia. And you see now these connections between cilia are made of threads which uh, finally attach to the gates of mechanical channels. And when we stretch these uh, th threads, the gates become open, so the channel becomes open. And these channels serve for potassium ions, and endolymph is rich in potassium ions. So, endolymph has unusually high concentration of potassium and low concentration of sodium, which is entirely uh, opposite to the classical extracellular fluid. So, it's practically very close to intracellular fluid, finally. And what is very important, cilia are placed and are bust in the endolymph, but it's considered that the bottoms of the cell, lower portions, are washed by the perineum from the side of lower tympanic staircase or scala tympani. And this perilymph is the um, fluid that is classical extracellular fluid with low potassium and high sodium. And so, therefore, the cell, hair cells have um, something like two portions, two different compartments with different gradients for potassium on the cilia apical surface and on the bottom of uh, lower portion of the cells. And now look what happens in case of movement of the cilia to the side of longer ones. And in this case stretching, stretching here for schematic purposes are shown as the uh, spring stretching and stretching opens the channels for potassium and potassium readily starts to go inside. So here we have depolarization by positive ion, but this positive ion is not sodium as usual, but potassium. And this depolarization produces a number of changes and finally activates the fibers, efferent nerve fibers of the auditory nerve. Let's observe how it goes. First, great number of potassium ions around. So 
and first event that is reason of all this is the mechanical event sound wave traveling along the cochlear basilar membrane and therefore bending of the cilia to the side of longer ones and it opens channels for potassium potassium readily goes inside not because of difference in concentration because practically there is no difference in concentration it's high inside high outside but you remember that this receptor is the excitable cell with classical negative membrane potential inside so positive potassium ions easily go inside because of negative charge inside and this depolarization of membrane opens the um, voltage gated calcium channels and voltage gated calcium channels allow calcium to enter and produce uh, exocytosis of transmitter here it's some something somehow similar to the synaptic processes when calcium comes through presynaptic membrane binds to synaptotegmin or other proteins and creates the process of exocytosis release of transmitter into the synaptic cleft and here similarly these calcium ions provide release of transmitter which is believed to be glutamate mostly or aspartate sometimes considered but glutamate mostly it's released binds to the receptors of the efferent nerve and excite so that action potential is generated. So let's observe this hair cell depolarization mechanism from the beginning. First event, deviation or movement of the cilia to the direction of longer ones, which stretches the threads and opens the channels. So next stage is opening of potassium channels. Due to opening of channels, potassium readily goes inside because of difference of charges greatly positive fluid endolymph due to rich uh, in, in potassium and uh, uh, charge in the, inside the membrane is negative. It produces the influx of potassium ions into hair cells. Then this influx of potassium positive ion decreases the negativity inside, produces depolarization. Depolarization influences the conformation of, of uh, calcium channels. These channels are voltage gated, so change of voltage to the depolarization opens these channels. And through open calcium channels, calcium goes due to concentration difference as usual. It's extracellular ion and it easily starts to go inside. And influx of calcium into the cell produces as a result exocytosis process. Or simply it results in the release of neurotransmitter, glutamate, let's say. And this transmitter binds to receptor, and of course not uh, easy, but also with some special specific mechanism, produces generation of action potential in the nerves, uh, in the auditory nerve fibers. And these action potentials are sent further to spiral ganglion, then further to medulla, then midbrain, then other and other centers until finally cortex. So. And this is important uh, question that depolarization is easily achieved, but when cilia bend to the opposite direction, they just close the potassium channels. Only closure of channels will not produce opposite change of uh, potential. Repolarization does not occur due to closure of channels. It just stops further entry of potassium, but number of potassium ions already entered and changed the potential. So we need to consider how repolarization comes. At least it's necessary to understand, maybe not necessarily to memorize, but understand. So depolarization of hair cells itself produces opening of the channels that provide repolarization. And there are two channels types. First, voltage-gated potassium channels for, pot for potassium and also calcium-gated potassium channels. Both channels become open because voltage is changed by depolarization and calcium enters when voltage is changed and calcium also opens potassium channels and both provide loss of potassium notice that all this happens in the basal part of the cell and in the basal part of the cell we have different compartment with uh, classical difference of potassium inside and outside in the third lymph therefore in case of opening of potassium channels potassium starts to go out as usual into perilymph so this potassium outflow very quickly, as quick as depolarization occurs, very quickly repolarizes the cell. 
Here the gradient is directed outside. So it's unusual that the same ion produces both depolarization and repolarization. Just potassium enters through the cilia from endolymph to produce depolarization and immediately repolarization occurs by loss of potassium ions in the bottom, in the basal part of the cell, into perilymph, and this loss of positive ions brings the depolarization back to hyperpolarization, at least the loss of depolarization. So it's very quickly, and you may notice here two types of channels, voltage-gated and, according to name calcium-gated, they should be ligand-gated. And perhaps you remember that ligand-gated channels never operate as quick as voltage-gated. But we need to have very quick process. And really these calcium-gated potassium channels are unusually fast. Uh, and the uh, velocity of opening is compared to voltage-gated. It's an unusual type of ligand-gated channels which uh, opens extremely quickly and therefore we have repolarization as quick as depolarization. As a result, practically, the uh, hair cells produce regular changes on the sound action of depolarization and repolarization and it looks like sinusoidal wave very similar to the wave of the sound itself, which we considered in the beginning of lecture. And look, this is exactly the potential of the receptor hair cells of the auditory system. And these are sinusoidal potentials that exactly look like, sign, mm, looks like, like sound waves recorded by the microphone or other technique. And it's called microphone potential. Sorry, uh, this, this is regular slide for to show you the microphone potential, but just previously shown larger. You see here, the uh, values are given, they are frequency. 300 hertz, 50 hertz, 500 hertz, and so on, until 1000 hertz. And you see, a record goes similarly to sound record. The same sinusoidal wave, with um, proportional to the intensity, amplitude, and exact corresponding to frequency, frequency of the record. That's why it was called microphone potential. It's the potential of the hair cells. Of course, it's not of individual one hair cells, but many hair cells. Mm -hmm. This potential is very unusual, as it doesn't have any latency, it doesn't have any threshold that can be measured, no refractory period, and no development of fatigue. So, as sound starts to act, immediately this potential appears. There is no latency. There is no such a sound that uh, does not produce uh, the microphone potential if it becomes conducted, if sound or conduction reaches the inner ear, it immediately produces microphone potential. Absence of refractory period is easy to explain because the potential does not use the channels which require restoration of position of gates. They only one type of gate open and then closed and closed channel is ready to open immediately. So there is no refractory period. But somehow there is no fatigue. Even when we consider that we don't hear uh, the sounds, really, microphone potential is generated. We just don't pay attention to the sounds. And at first, when it was recorded, it was recorded in experiments on, uh, on a cat. The uh, microphone was, uh, not, not microphone, recording electrode was placed nearby the round window of the cat in experiment. And they recorded the potential, biological potential. And then they use this record, as we use a record of sounds mechanically produced by uh, microphone. And when they put it into uh, sound production, the uh, sound was going exactly as it was heard by people. So even what uh, researchers uh, said each other during this experiment, all was uh, easily heard from this record. But it was a, not a technical record. It was a record of biological potential of a cat. And it was so amazing. It was called microphone potential. Really, you see, it resembles classical record produced by microphone. You see that uh, frequency corresponds exactly to the frequency of sound. But from certain point, we cannot record anymore the sound, the same um, frequency. And there is a little uh, summation more and more progressively. And this is called summation of potential. And, but it's believed to, to be not the potential of hair cells, but potential of the auditory nerve fibers. And fibers generate already impulses. 
and impulses cannot follow this frequency of sound because you remember that there is the absolute refractory period for action potentials and the frequencies above 1000 hardly can practically cannot be achieved because at least about um, close to one millisecond refractory period lasts but still even these summation potentials uh, help mm, still you can see the asynchronous mm, see the variable component this variable component is still observed and it makes very thick line above and <coughs> This very thick line is a um, um, product of uh, still not full summation. There is constant shift, but um, not. Um, but you can observe that it gradually disappears with uh, 2,000. It's still um, visible, this asynchronous component, uh, and then it becomes less, less, and less. And finally, at the value about 5,000 hertz, we can reach the full summation. Full summation. And <coughs> now one more potential. Don't be scared. Endocochlear potential is just simply the, the charge of the endolymph. And this high positive charge is created by high concentration of potassium ions. This charge is approximately about plus 80 millivolt. And hair cells have rest in the brain potential, inner side charge, minus 60 millivolt. Therefore, the difference of charges, different potential difference, this is driving force for entry of potassium, is exactly 140 millivolt. This is a very great force for ions, very great force. And it's a reason, one of best reasons for high sensitivity to sound. Just minimal opening, minimal shift of the cilia, minimal number of channels opening produces great entry of potassium. So this strong force, 140 millivolt, makes potassium to go easily through open channels each time when they become open. So, but Let's recall, the, let's come to back previous slide. Always potassium comes through cilia, but then for repolarization, potassium is lost through the basal part of the cell. So it constantly moves from the endolymph, but it doesn't come immediately to the endolymph back because it goes into perilymph. And so it's necessary to maintain high potassium concentration in the endolymph constantly. And that is what is about the next slide. And the lymph constantly has this plus 80 and inner hair cells minus 60 so it makes the 140 millivolt difference which should be maintained otherwise the force that makes potassium to enter becomes decreased more and more decreased and less and less ions will readily move into cells therefore the hearing sensitivity will become progressively lost but it doesn't become lost normally because potassium is constantly moved and moved into the endolymph by the um, active transport of potassium from blood to the endolymph. And it goes by the lateral wall of scala media, shown here in yellow. This is the stria vascularis that you studied perhaps in histology or anatomy. All this here in the cross section, you can observe just a little piece, but it goes as a strip through the whole. Uh, uh, whole cochlea, lateral wall of the skull and media. Stria vascularis contains many vessels clearly and uh, many specific uh, mechanisms to pump potassium into the endolymph. Endolymph already has a lot of potassium so only active transport can make it to move more and more. And this is the movement of potassium into the skull and media by stria vascularis. Full mechanism is not necessarily to for full consideration. You just may observe that it's really not very easy thing, like Washington University suggests. But why I give this slide? Because it explains for future pharmacology effect of certain medicines on the, um, on uh, acute uh, ability to hear uh, sounds. Look, last uh, line of cells that uh, borders with endolymph 
constantly releases potassium into endermine. And here you have, um, you can see many um, shown in black pumps, regular pumps, they use ATP, active transport. But there is one transporter, not shown in black because it doesn't use energy. And this sodium potassium chlorine transporter. No energy is required, just sodium enters down the gradient passively and takes to, uh, along both chlorine and potassium. Of course, the sodium entry will quickly um, stop because of accumulation of sodium inside. Therefore, uh, only man, um, constant gradient for sodium can be maintained by sodium potassium pump, regular pump that uses ATP. But why we are interested in sodium uh, potassium chlorine co-transporter? Because similar transporter is present in the loop uh, of Henle in the kidney tubules. And uh, we have uh, very powerful diuretics, which, produce, uh, which produces the quick formation of urine and quick loss of big amount of uh, fluid. And in many cases it's required, especially in the uh, um, intensive, um, intensive care units, these drugs can be used for a patient who need quickly to remove excess of fluid. But they block this transporter in the kidney and they additionally can block the similar transporter in the striovascularis. And of course, usually if it's used for one or two times or not for a long time, not necessarily it will produce such a reaction. <coughs> but at least uh, it's not um, allowed to use it for a long time because it can result in loss of ability to hear um, soft sounds. This is the adverse effect of the loop diuretics. You'll study in future this furosemid is classical example of loop diuretics. They are very powerful, <coughs> but they can be not good for hearing ability because similar transporters can be blocked. Now, impulses. I already mentioned that inner hair cells provide most of information about sounds to the brain, about 90%, while outer hair cells may have one fiber <coughs> for all three cells in an adjacent rows. But as for efferent fibers, maximally they come to the outer hair cells, which somehow can influence the sensitivity of the inner hair cells. And this mechanism is not still uh, studied fully. So, but now let's consider what may happen in case of action of the very intensive sounds. It's called, uh, such called um, acoustic trauma. Look, this is uh, normal hair cells. At least you can see the surface, apical surface, with normal lines of cilia. But compare what may happen in case of intensity, uh, very intense sound action. You see, now where normal rows of cilia were placed, now nothing is present, just the uh, openings. No cilia at all. You may understand that such cells simply cannot respond to sound. But even smaller traumatic damage can produce problems. Just imagine if the cilia are present, but the connection between them is lost. So there is no way to open channels. No opening of channels, no depolarization, no microphone potential, nothing can be heard. So it's necessary to care about ears and prevent action of extremely loud sounds. It's not good for health, especially for an auditory system. So care of your ears because they have natural tendency to decrease sensitivity with age, not to say about additional damaging by extremely loud sounds. And uh, try to limit your usage of the earphones because it's also not physiological, especially if we use rather loud uh, voices. But now let's come back to physiology. The general mechanism of activation of cells and sending impulses is clear, but how we differentiate sounds? All sounds can stimulate hair cells regardless of frequency. How we can clearly, easily differ sounds which are higher or lower in their frequency or pitch? These mechanisms <coughs> were considered for many years and uh, they are uh, theories of hearing. And first theory was suggested by Hermann Helmholtz in, 19, in 18, sorry, 1863, very long ago. Helmholtz 
and had made many research in sensory systems. He, systems. he studied eyes, he studied ears, and his theory in many, many points is correct even by now. His um, original picture of the um, uh, basal membrane and its fibers passing from the um, base of cochlea to the apex. By the way, let's recall again, I didn't mention it during consideration of structure of cochlea. It's very important that somehow it manages to behave oppositely to the uh, shape of cochlea. Cochlea begins from basal part, which is thicker, of course, then becomes uh, the second row, second uh, uh, circle, becomes smaller and smaller, progressive to apex. But the basal, basal membrane behaves oppositely. It starts from the most narrow portion in the base of cochlea and it becomes progressively wider and wider to the apex. Taking into account that at the apex it is small size, you may imagine how little is this structure. And look at these values mm, to the left. But first, what was the idea of Helmholtz? He decided on the <coughs> basis of the musical instrument uh, understanding of mechanism of especially for string instrument they considered that under action of sounds of different frequencies we involve into resonance different fibers of basilar membrane so and as he studied these fibers that pass inside the basilar membrane they have different lengths and different thickness and therefore, he suggested that according to strings of piano or many other musical instruments with strings, the shorter and uh, thicker uh, produce higher sounds, and the longer ones and thinner produce lower sounds. And so he suggested the distribution of frequencies along the whole length of cochlea. This is up apex where the membrane is widest and therefore fibers that pass uh, through radius of the cochlea are longest. This longest reach 0.5 millimeters in length, but they are longest. And in the base of cochlea, where the basal membrane is narrow, very short and thick fibers exist. And I cannot even show so little as they are, but the length is about four hundreds of millimeter only. And so he placed all the frequencies along the basal membrane. And you can observe these values maximally at the base of 20,000 hertz and minimal less than 200 hertz and progressively less and less in the apex. And really, he was correct in this. And uh, experiments were done when, for example, the dogs were trained for uh, reflexes in response to low sound and high sounds and then they destroyed part of cochlea unfortunately in these dogs and then in depending on which part of cochlea is destroyed these dogs lost uh, lost the ability to to produce reflexes in response to corresponding sounds if it was destruction of the basis they lost uh, reflexes only for high sound and when destruction was done for the apex of the cochlea the reflexes were lost for low sound. And so it was the improvement uh, on supported the theory of resonance. And in mostly he was correct in all his studies. And just the main thing, the main that given the resonance name to the theory, exactly this was not correct because it was it turned out later that it's not possible to involve into vibration just the only one part of the membrane and only one of few fibers like this. Mm. But le then new theory, now it's not much new, you see it's uh, produced by uh, a researcher von Bekeshi. Uh, he worked in Europe, then went to uh, uh, USA and worked there, and it was suggested around uh, 1960. The theory of traveling wave, running wave, traveling wave, which again this is the original picture of this uh, researcher, and he investigated how uh, vibration of the basal membrane goes. And he found that depending on frequency, at first it vibrates less than more and more uh, with high and high amplitude. Then in certain piece of uh, membrane, amplitude reaches maximum. And then very soon it becomes uh, decreased and lost. 
and this amplitude maximum uh, is located exactly according to predicted portions of the membrane uh, by Helmholtz. Here you see very simplified picture from base to apex. The basal membrane is presented as line, so there is no uh, not spiral case, but just the straightened. But for example, here along the basal membrane, from base to apex to cochlea of cochlea, vibration reaches the maximum amplitude exactly in this point, amplitude maximum, and therefore he suggested that the excitation of cells occurs only in the area of amplitude maximum. Of course, it uh, requires much more additional explanations, but at least it's the fact and it's established that many parts of membrane become involved into vibration, but not everywhere we have excitation, and excitation occurs in an uh, amplitude maximum. And <coughs> so this explains why we have so um, selective sensitivity to frequencies. But frequencies points along the membrane are according to predicted previously by Hermann Helmholtz. Here you can see more um, correct examples of the traveling wave passing along the basal membrane. Just again for simplicity, the cochlea is uncoiled and shown as one long tube. And you may observe that here at the base of cochlea we have wider area, but the membrane, basal membrane is narrow and it becomes uh, wider and wider progressively to the uh, end of cochlea, to apex. And it's important that uh, fibers are not only short, but very stiff, hard to involve into vibration. And gradually the um, fibers become less stiff and less and finally very lax fibers in the end. They are thinner, longer and lax, not very uh, tightened. And so the properties, uh, the features are changing and they respond uh, due to this to different frequencies and frequencies uh, high frequency again look at this high frequency in the beginning of uh, cochlea in the basement and uh, low frequencies in the end and here you, you have example of wave that goes along the left side and this is a high frequency wave where it quickly reaches the maximum and quickly dies before it reaches even half of wave but low frequency wave practically cannot involve the fibers in the beginning, short and stiff fibers of the base of cochlea. But uh, as the wave slightly goes along, it reaches a high amplitude in the end, where fibers are not as uh, stiff, and low frequency produces maximal uh, amplitude of uh, wave exactly closer to end of the basal membrane, to the apex. And here, frequency maximums, you see, it looks like guitar grief or something like this. And all distribution of frequencies practically repeats the similar uh, understanding of the suggested by Hermann Helmholtz, with frequencies, or minimal frequencies in the end apex of the cochlear and maximal frequencies up to 20,000 hertz in the mm, base of the cochlear, in the beginning of the basilar membrane. So, and Due to this, we recognize frequencies because each corresponding point of the membrane excites corresponding cells and finally it becomes conducted also into specific portions of the cortex. And this uh, difference is maintained on all the levels of the conducting pathways. Only uh, for specific uh, frequencies we have one pathway and another and another and all for different frequencies. And so we can easily differentiate sounds which are different in frequency just a little. We have great sensitivity to um, difference in frequencies. Not to say about people with uh, perfect, absolute musical uh, ability to hear. Even uh, regular abilities are very good. So, how finally we encode sound frequencies? That's uh, the way that I explained before now, is that spatial encoding. You see, different points in mm, membrane, basal membrane, corresponding to excite corresponding cells, and so this is a spatial type of encoding, distribution of cells along the space. And similarly, distribution uh, goes in the cortex, where one portion of cortex corresponds to uh, low sounds, the next to medium frequency sounds, and finally one, another portion of the uh, auditory cortex uh, responds to the high frequency sounds. So for all sound frequencies, we have this spatial type of encoding.
So we see. Hair cells are excited in a specific area depending on uh, maximal of amplitude. Then specific neurons become excited and finally specific portions of the auditory cortex receive this excitation. So this is classical spatial encoding. But for some, so some frequencies we have additional temporal encoding because for some frequencies less than 1000 of hertz especially and slightly for sounds so until 5 kilohertz where uh, summation still um, gives opportunity to observe alternating components AC from this picture that you saw previously summational potential there is a constant shift of potential but also alternating component is still present so until 5 kilohertz when full summation is achieved for these lower frequencies we ad additionally may have temporal encoding because for very low sounds, the frequency of impulses may correspond exactly to frequency of sounds. And for higher frequencies, but less than 5 kHz, we still have burst of impulses of the same frequency, and this periodicity analysis can be achieved, and so we can understand, can get the low frequency sounds, differentiate them by temporal way of encoding, encoding in time by impulses, uh, individually impulses rate or burst, increase of uh, frequency of impulses, which occur with the same frequency with sounds. And this especially spatial encoding is used for restoration of hearing when person has damage of the sound perceiving apparatus, like for example, like with damage very high frequency, high intensity sounds, you saw the, the acoustic trauma. Just, of course, it's necessary to, to have still preserved efferent fibers of the auditory nerve because when these uh, nerve fibers die, there is nothing to stimulate. But if uh, hair cells are dead, uh, lost, but uh, fibers of the auditory nerves are still present, it's possible to imitate action of hair cells. And this, is in, in this way of restoration uses spatial encoding. This is a cochlear implant, implanting. What is done? Here we have schematic presentation of such implantation. The microphone is placed outside on a headpiece, but uh, subcutaneously there is a plantation of the cochlear stimulator. This stimulator provides analysis of sounds. And um, well, before we consider next, what is analysis of sounds? It divides each complex sound into specific individual frequencies, like our ears do, because when we hear a complex sound, each sound frequency stimulates different points in the in cochlear uh, medium, uh, medium staircase. And we have, uh, at the same time, few areas with the maximal amplitude, and so we simply produce this frequency analysis, like uh, modern apparatus. And so, then, from this stimulator, the set of electrodes goes into the cochlea. And this set of electrodes has a difference in lengths. And one, um, first electrodes reach only the base of cochlea, then a longer electrode come late, come further, further, and finally, the area of electrode reaches the <coughs> apex of cochlea. So this is example of electrodes that stimulate the base of cochlea. But these electrodes are activated when the um, cochlear uh, sound analysis, uh, frequency analysis in the implant, in implant uh, finds the um, short frequencies, uh, low fr high frequencies and short sounds. So in case of high frequencies, uh, electrodes are stimulated that reach only the base of cochlea. And there are many other electrodes that come to each individual portion of the cochlea and the longest electrodes reach the apex of cochlea. And these electrodes become activated when sounds are detected of low frequency. Therefore, finally, we have um, practically imitation of real stimulation um, of uh, hair cells by sounds of different frequencies. And of course, it cannot perhaps produce the same quality of uh, hearing as natural mechanisms. But uh, at least these people are, uh, with uh, correction, 
by cochlear implants can understand human speech, which makes big difference. Uh, compare simply deafness and ability to, uh, to hear speech and understand speech. This is great difference and it's very good that we can use this mechanism. Just again, it's necessary to have preserved the nerves themselves. And of course, it's possible to correct the uh, inability to hear when there is a problem with middle ear. It's for a long time already done by prosthesis, uh, which are used instead of an uh, ossicle system, and they can be substituted by this, and the uh, ability to hear is restored. Then, until now, we considered how we perceive sounds, then we considered how we differentiate sounds in frequencies a pitch of sound, and now sound intensity. It's rather easy because more intensive sound will produce a greater amplitude of the microphone potential. And so, but there are also an additional mechanism, the involvement, additional excitation of fibers that located near to the fibers that have maximal sensitivity to the frequency. We have uh, the characteristic frequency of the neurons, uh, neuron fibers located nearby the hair cells where the maximal amplitude is achieved. So there we have maximal excitation. And nearby located uh, neurons become activated much less. But with high and high intensity, the involvement increases. And the more the nearby located cells are involved, the wider is area involved into excitation, the higher we understand the highest intensity of the sound. Then also there is additional mechanism increasing direct stimulation of the inner hair cells. And normally these cells are react only to sounds of medium and especially high intensity. Because when sounds are very low, pre predominantly they are um, Stim they produce uh, stimulation of the um, outer hair cells. And high and high involvement of inner hair cells also contributes to sensation of stronger, more intensive sounds. So these are mechanisms of uh, understanding of sound intensity, differentiation of intensity of sounds. And finally, we come to determination of the direction of the sound, location of the sound source. Our accuracy here is uh, 1 to 3 uh, degree of angle, 1 to 3. Of course, it's different from visual acuity, but it should not be so um, exact. But it, it's very accurate anyway. We can detect the difference. And there are two mechanisms of detection of this difference, main ways. For low frequency, it's one mechanism. For high frequency, it's different. For low frequency, we determine basically the difference of time difference in time of uh, the wave, sound wave coming into one and another ear. So time difference of sound wave arrival to different ears. And this difference in time can be microscopic, but we'll consider. Then, for high frequencies, mechanism is different. This is determination of difference of intensity. Intensity, difference of sound wave that comes to the right and left ears. And there are cases when the sound uh, source is located perfectly in the sagittal plane. In this case, to both ears, the sound wave comes with the same time and without any differences in intensity. But still there is mm, necessary to locate the sound source because in one and the same plane, it can be located first mm, ahead or behind. Then it can be higher or lower located in, um, so it's necessary to find, and here we have the ear pinna, which helps to understand it. So, and let's consider in more details how it's done. First, for there are pictures for low frequency. Low frequency, low frequency of sound means that sound has great wavelengths, high, uh, long wavelengths. And what we can say, low frequency, it's wavelengths usually is at least comparable or larger than size of our head. The, all this based on the size of our head and different distance between ears. And when the sound of high wavelengths reaches the head, it goes around because it's very little obstacle for the wave. And these waves can uh, go around. 
No, for, of course, not necessarily like this shown, but anyway, if sound source is located slightly to the side of the sagittal plane, you can observe that going around takes longer time to reach the other ear, which is more distant. And this difference in time exactly we detect. But here it's necessary to explain that sometimes if, we, if our accuracy is one to three degree of angle, you, mean, you see that it almost uh, can be pressed, um, pressed slightly uh, to the side from the sagittal plane. And in this case, uh, according to different calculations, there can be difference uh, for one ear distance and the other ear distance can be about just one centimeter or so. And if you compare to the velocity of uh, movement of sound wave, this uh, distance of one centimeter I calculated long ago, as far as I remember, it makes about 30 microseconds. And it's hard, hard to understand how the brain can detect this difference in time. It's such a difference in time that we cannot even imagine. But in the superior olivary complex, there is a specific mechanism that detects slight shift from the side to the side of the source of the sound. And even this 30 microsecond, can be detected due to very complexly arranged system of neurons with numerous divergence and convergence that provides sh detection of this shift. If it's interesting, you can find it or uh, ask later, but now it's not the task of the lecture. Just we can detect very little difference in time, and uh, usually little difference. Now let's move to the high frequencies. As for the high frequencies, they are Mm, wavelength is very very short and for such waves our head is very great obstacle therefore the short waves are simply reflected from the obstacle they cannot travel around therefore to the other ear which is uh, somehow like in the sound channel to the other ear wave comes weaker and here we detect difference in intensity so intensity difference. So that's why we have difference in uh, location of sources of low and high sounds. And finally, the ear pinion sound in sagittal plane comes from the source of the sagittal plane. And so sound comes without difference in intensity and time difference comes simultaneously equally to both ears. And here our ear pin comes to the first place. And Ear pinna has a structure that makes difference between sounds that come from ahead or from behind. And also it's difference in that sounds come from above or from beneath. Even the slight change of frequencies occurs due to this. Different selection of frequencies due to such um, complex shape of the ear pinna. And we still, due to this, uh, Mm, subconsciously can differentiate difference in, in these um, waves and additionally we can move the head and so sound immediately starts slightly um, higher better heard or less and therefore we also can determine but even the presence of ear pin helps to find the source of sound if it is located perfectly in the sagittal plane so and now we come to the consideration of final um, stage of the analysis of sounds, auditory cortex. The conduction pathways we considered before, and now let's recall where the primary auditory cortex is located. Most it's hidden from view in the temporal lobe, but it's the superior temporal gyrus. This is a portion in the middle somewhere approximately. This is a primary auditory cortex, and it has map, or they say many maps, uh, many times, uh, repeatedly uh, send impulses to the uh, cortex from the um, corti organ neurons, receptor of course first by the neurons. And uh, belt around, area around, is the auditory secondary cortex. Maybe one more, a uh, few more slides. This is numbering. For the first, it's a cortex area primary visual cortex, and number 42 is lies around or sometimes it's shown from symmetrically from both sides uh, for the second area this is secondary auditory cortex 41 42 these are classical broadman cortex broadman's cortex areas for analysis of sound primary and secondary here again 
first auditory primary and this belt around this is a secondary cortex 40 second if we open this you see here you have a picture with open temporal lobe and you can see distribution of the uh, areas that uh, receive information from corresponding portions of the cochlea so that uh, there is full correspondence the lower tones that come from the apex they come exactly to the um, superficial layer of the auditory cortex then middle tones shown in red in cochlea and they correspondingly are conducted to the uh, portion of the cortex shown in red and finally high tones in the base of cochlea these base of cochlea pathways provide impulses sending into yellow part of the uh, auditory cortex so and on all the level at all, all the level of the conduction pathways everywhere we have still maintained this tonotopic spatial correspondence lower tones correspond to one place and conducted to one specific portion and lower and higher all in, in, your, in their corresponding areas then a little bit uh, information about asymmetrical difference between right and left auditory cortex perception of different sounds here you see the pictures that show maximal activity in auditory cortex dependent on difference in sounds and here you have both right and left of course the brain is active highly and it's just the subtraction of baseline, acti baseline activity and it shows the difference now mainly left and right uh, hemispheres and you see first is a uh, sound type is a speech second is uh, environmental sounds like um, um, wind or uh, movement of uh, leaves or something like this water running and, and third case is the music and in all cases there is a little difference little or big let's observe for speech speech of course is conducted into both uh, hemispheres as simply sounds so you can see in the 41st uh, primary cortex it's conducted almost equally practically but in 42nd here you can observe maximal uh, serious predominance of the left hemispheres I hope you already remember that exactly the left hemisphere contains speech centers so it's not uh, surprising that left hemisphere performs maximal secondary auditory analysis of the uh, speech mm, sounds and then sounds of the environment difference again there is no big difference of conduction between um, right and left hemispheres for the primary auditory cortex the difference is present but it's negligible statistically perhaps it will be not uh, proven but difference between the left and right hemispheres is rather big and you see predominantly the sounds not related to speech are analyzed by the right hemisphere and now we come to the third case music sounds you see even according to the picture you may observe which is how big difference is between left and right hemispheres and again of course both ears can easily hear and both ears provide conduction to the corresponding primary uh, the auditory cortex area and again in 41st area difference is not big present not not big almost equal but secondary auditory cortex that produces analysis and perception mostly participates in the perception you see practically music is assessed by right hemisphere left hemisphere participation in this max, uh, is uh, minimal, minimal negligible actually the left hemisphere is logical one so music and logic are different things so clearly music is perceived by the right hemisphere predominantly then very important sounds for us of course are sounds of speech and finally they should be <coughs> past uh, information about the sounds of speech should be analyzed by the area of the mm, vernica which is an uh, area of sensory center of speech for understanding and you see primary auditory cortex and secondary or even around including all the rest visual interpretative somatic all these 
finally comes to the Wernicke's area, which is responsible for not only estimation of words, understanding of words, but generally it's the center of intellectual functioning. And exactly, Wernicke's center should always get information from primary auditory cortex, at least for understanding of words that are heard by ears and uh, conducted to the primary and secondary auditory cortex. And it's uh, clear why it's located just uh, nearby and behind in the mm, temporal lobe, close, of course, to the parietal, but close to the auditory cortex, because they are related with the hearing and understanding of hearing words are, uh, is necessary for the function of the brain. And that's all the lecture about auditory system. And you see, auditory system is also not easy, but very interesting, I hope. So, wish you good understanding. Thank you for attention.